Hello, and welcome back again to the third and final installment of our journey through Pablum. You know, I initially set out to re-record this lecture to make it quicker and punchier, and that did not happen because it turns out there is a lot to say about this topic, but thanks for sticking with me so far. And let's conclude our epic trilogy on game mechanics and how they can deliver feedback for learning beyond just simple surface level rewards. So far, in the first part of our trilogy, we went over the uses of feedback and rewards in games, how rewards and Skinner box conditioning work, and also how they don't work when it comes to learning and development. And we looked at some examples of how to use points and scoring mechanics to change the dynamics or aesthetics of a design for different purposes. Then last time, in part two, we looked at achievements, badges, levels, and leaderboards, which are all mechanics that create feedback about objectives and outcomes and progress in various ways, both relative to game systems themselves and player interactions and individual history within those systems. And now today, we are going to finish out by taking a look at the last two mechanics in the Pablum framework, unlocks and upgrades, and mana. As you can see, these two categories serve complementary functions, either expanding or narrowing the decision space of a game. We're going to talk about what that means and why it's important for learning in just a minute. One last callback to last time, the Pablum model is inspired in part by this quote from John Dewey about the differences between play and work as they relate to human endeavor. The first item in Pablum, points, is kind of doing its own thing, turning inputs into numbers that allow designers to develop metrics and quantitative models and generally do math at stuff, but the other mechanical categories are sorted into groups that align with Dewey's definition of work in terms of progress and outcomes, and then to his definition of play, the experience of flowing from moment to moment, which is what we're going to talk about today. The mechanics of unlocks or upgrades and mana are both concerned with regulating that in-the-moment flow of experience in gameplay in complementary ways, and they can serve that same purpose in designing learning environments as well. So now we come back to decision space. I've mentioned this term before, but I don't think I've given a concrete definition yet, so here you go. Decision space is the range of possible choices or interactions that a game affords to a player at any given moment. This term is particularly popular among board game designers and fans, and it simply means, on your turn, what are all the possible decisions you can make based on the current state of the game board and the pieces and cards and whatever else you have. So a small or narrow decision space means that you don't have a lot of options. There are only maybe a couple of choices you can make. While a wide decision space means that you have lots of choices, potentially dozens or even hundreds of moves in some games that you could make on your turn. So what makes the difference between these two states of narrow or wide decision space? Just to get a little more granular, let's further define a couple of keywords in that sentence. To say that a choice is possible means that it's somewhere in between an impossible action, something that is against the rules of the game and not allowed or not possible, and a mandatory interaction, something that you have to do, like for example, drawing a card or rolling the dice at the start of your turn in a board game. That's not a choice, that's a required action as part of the rules. Then affordance is a design term that extends to lots of areas beyond games, but it means an action that a person can do and is aware that they can do in a given situation. Think about navigating an avatar in a video game. 
the first thing you have to figure out in a new game is how you can and cannot move around and interact with the world, and which controller inputs translate into which movements. You just have to know that you can do those things and how to do them in order to play the game the way it's designed to be played. So taken all together, Decision Space is about how a game gives players information on what they can do from moment to moment and how to do it. And so Decision Space is particularly handy in board games because kind of by necessity, board games have a limited number of active elements in play on any given turn and a finite number of possible moves. So you can actually measure the decision space pretty concretely. But the concept can apply to any kind of game or really any kind of interactive system at all where you have to make decisions. And it has some powerful implications for how we think about learning as well. You should recognize this diagram of Bloom's taxonomy from last time. And of course, now you see that I deliberately framed it visually as a progression from a small area to a progressively wider area with each step. Learning opens up new possibilities for how the learner can interact with an idea or a subject. There's a couple of different ways to think about this. One perspective is that all of these possibilities already exist and that learning is just becoming more attuned and aware of the range of options available. Think of learning to drive a car, either in real life or in a video game. All the controls are there from the very beginning, the steering wheel, gas, brake, gear shift, and so on. So those things don't change, but as you learn and gain driving experience, you'll be more confident and effective in how you can use those controls to navigate where you're going. So from a perspective like this, like situated learning theory, you're not so much opening up new possibilities as you learn, you are becoming more attuned to possibilities that already exist in the environment. Then of course the other perspective is that you are growing and expanding and creating new options as you learn. So in theories like social constructivism, learning is more like building a house, uh, either a real one or a Minecraft house, where you start with more basic elements like wood and brick and glass, and when you arrange and combine them correctly, you get something entirely new, with new affordances that you have created that weren't there before. Now, neither of these perspectives is better or more correct than the other. They're both useful ways to approach designing for learning, depending on what you're trying to do and the mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics of the experience you're trying to create. And what's shown here is just the big overall picture, but frequently you'll also want to zoom in on just one layer of decisions and challenge your students in more targeted ways. So let's talk about how to plan for that. Different games can have very different decision spaces, and even within a single game, the size of the decision space will probably change over time. There are four main possibilities for that to happen in a game. Some games have an increasing decision space where you start off with very few options. You're making very simple choices at the beginning, this is your classic RPG or strategy game formula, where you start off with like one guy in a little village gathering food or wood, and by the end you've got armies and castles and treasure and just tons of things you can do in the game world. Then other games have a decreasing decision space over time, like in chess, where you start off with a full set of pieces, and within the first few rounds, you can easily have dozens of legal moves available on each turn. But as pieces are eliminated from the board, you have progressively fewer and fewer options on future turns. Puzzle games can work this way too, where you have lots of pieces to use when you start a puzzle, but as you begin to figure it out and lock some of those pieces into position, you have fewer options to consider and your decisions actually become simpler as you get closer to the solution. 
Still other games can cycle their decision space up and down, where on some turns you might have a wide range of choices and have to do some complex planning, but on other turns you have very few choices and you don't have to think as hard about what you're going to do, you just have to do it. And the game will cycle back and forth between lots of choices and then fewer choices back and forth. Catan and other card-based games are like this, where the size of your decision space is directly tied to the number of cards in your hand on each turn. And if you don't have any cards, then you have to wait until you do, or do whatever you need to do to get more cards, before you can continue to make those decisions and pursue more complicated goals. And lastly, lots of other games have a pretty steady decision space throughout. Most team sports, for example, the basic strategies of play stay at pretty much the same level of complexity for the whole game. They might go up or down a little bit, but they don't vary a lot from the beginning to the end. Or in action or fighting games where you play as a character with a predefined set of abilities that they use throughout the game, so the challenge is more on your skill with effectively executing your choices than on your decision-making ability to pick good choices in the first place. So decision space can go up or down over the course of a game, or up and down in a cycle, or hold steady. And this is what I mean when I say that we're talking about the moment-to-moment -moment flow of play because this is all about how much information players have available and how much they have to process each turn or each minute of play in order to keep up with a game. In other words, how immersed is the player and how much of their attention does the game occupy throughout the course of play? And if the player starts to feel pulled out of the moment, either because there's not enough choice to keep their attention fully engaged, or because there's too much and they're getting overwhelmed, how, as a designer, would you adjust for that to pull them back into the game? And luckily for you, I am about to answer that right now, starting by tools for expanding decision space with unlocks and upgrades. You've already had some experience with unlock mechanics by now because this course is built around them. That's very much the core mechanic of the whole design. So unlocks are mechanics that introduce new elements into the game, like getting a new type of weapon in an action game, or a new team member in an RPG, or opening up a new area to explore in an open world game. Upgrades are a little bit subtler because they improve or build on elements that already exist, like boosting a character's health or strength, or building houses and hotels to increase the value of properties in Monopoly. Upgrades generally let you do more and take on bigger challenges with your existing toolkit, rather than adding new options to it. This isn't always a clean distinction, like for instance in platforming games like Mario. If you get an ability that lets you jump higher, that will probably let you clear obstacles more easily, or it could also let you access entirely new areas of the world that are impossible without it. So that's potentially both an upgrade and an unlock, depending on precisely how it gets used. But that's kind of academic. The point is that either way, the mechanic is expanding the player's decision space and creating more range of choice as they play. The illustration shown here is from the mobile game Kingdom Rush Origins, which is a good example. It's a tower defense game where gameplay revolves around defending your base by building different kinds of defensive towers to hold back progressive waves of enemy attackers. So at the start of every level, you build some basic towers, and then for every enemy they destroy, you earn gold that you can spend to upgrade your tower to shoot further, do more damage. And then when you upgrade a tower to level 3, 
At the next level, you can unlock two different advanced tower options that each have further special abilities that you can also unlock and upgrade as well. So for example, look at the archery towers in the column on the left. You start at the beginning of a level by building a level one archer tower on an empty space. Then you upgrade it to level two and three to give it longer attack range and a little higher damage. And then you'll have the choice to turn it either into an arcane archer, which attacks very fast and can do burst damage to multiple enemies, or to a golden longbow, which is slow, but has extremely long range and does very high damage to a single target. And each of those options has secondary powers you can buy and upgrade as well. So you start off every stage the same way, by building basic towers, and then as you go along, you're presented with an increasing range of decisions. Do you want to upgrade your existing towers to be more powerful, or build new basic towers to cover more areas of the map? And when you do upgrade, what special abilities will be most useful against the enemies in this stage, and so on. So that's what I mean when I'm talking about expanding decision space. Here's another somewhat more long-term example, and if you really want to dig into unlock and upgrade mechanics, there is no game that does it better than the Pokemon franchise. This whole series is built entirely around discovering and unlocking new monsters and then upgrading your team into more powerful versions of themselves, unlocking new areas of the game world, and new abilities that let you explore further and play in new ways, and so on. And the games are really great at hinting and guiding you along this unlock path, like they'll show you stuff in early areas that you can see but you can't get to it until you unlock some key ability and then you are rewarded if you can go back to those early areas and explore them again in new ways that weren't possible before. If I ever had carte blanche to design a immersive learning game from the ground up, if somebody just dropped a budget and an art and programming team on me, it would probably be structured very much like a Pokemon game. So just to illustrate how all of these unlock and upgrade mechanics affect the in-the-moment decision space of the game, take a look at this rough calculation of the choices available in an early game battle versus a late game battle. So in your first few battles at the start of the game, you'll have a single Pokemon that you picked from one of three starting options of fire, water, or grass type. It will know two or three moves, and you will be facing a single opponent. So you will have, at most, maybe three options each turn in these early battles, and you'll be using them to overcome a single, clearly known opponent. Then, by the later part of the game, you will have a team of six Pokémon, each of which can have either one or two types, and your team will have to cover a decent range across all 18 types, including things like Steel and Ghost and Poison and so on. Each of those Pokemon will know four moves out of a possible list of 20 to 30, depending on their species. Each one can hold an item, of which there are easily a dozen or two decent choices, depending. And you will be facing opponents who also have four or five or six Pokemon with a range of different types and moves, and that's not even getting into half of the factors that can alter the conditions of a battle in various ways as well. So on any given turn, you might have easily a dozen options of what you could do, and the challenge will keep changing as well. Like if you beat your opponent's electric type, but then the next thing they send out is a dark type, you will need to change your strategy and make different decisions to beat that one. But with all that, the Pokemon games introduce all of these new elements so smoothly that you won't even notice how much more complex your decision making becomes over the game, and a typical 9 or 10 year old can master 
all of these interlocking parts and systems well enough to beat the game all on their own. And that's why I think they're so great as examples of learning games. So that's unlocks and expanding the decision space. So now let's move on to the opposite, or perhaps it would be better to say the complementary mechanic, which is eliminating choices and reducing the decision space through mana mechanics. So mana is kind of a funny word. If you've ever played a fantasy game before, you probably already know pretty much exactly what it means. But if you haven't played fantasy games, then this is likely the first time you've ever heard this word, even if you've played other games that use these resource mechanics but just call it something different. But we'll get to that. So the word is originally a Polynesian term, meaning spiritual strength or power, which was stolen by Victorian occultists during the heyday of the British Empire, repopularized in America during the New Age movement a century or so later, and from there started to appear in fantasy fiction and then fantasy games by around the 1970s. So in these games, mana or mana points or MP is the fuel for casting magic spells. Every spell costs a certain amount of mana, and so you're limited in how many spells you can cast in the game before you need to recharge your mana somehow. So in the context of the Pablum model, I'm using the word mana to describe not just magic systems in fantasy games, but also any sort of resource-limiting mechanic that reduces the options available to a player. That could be ammunition in a shooter, money or natural resources in a city builder, the shot clock in basketball, cards in a card game, action points in a tactics game, and so on and so on. All of these mechanics work to limit player options in some way and push them to narrow down their decision space to prioritize their most important objectives first. Another generic term for this actually very diverse category of mechanics is energy systems. I'm not using that because I think it's vague, and also I needed a word that started with M so I could make the whole acronym spell Pablum. So I'm calling it all mana, and you're just going to have to go along with it. Now, what's really cool about mana mechanics is that by using them to narrow the decision space, they can be used to either raise or lower the challenge in a particular moment in the game. For example, by limiting ammunition in a shooter game, you can make it harder to clear all the enemies out of a level, so you really have to make every shot count. But on the flip side, limiting the number of actions you can make in a term in a game like Stardew Valley creates actually a much more relaxing experience where once you've accomplished your main goals for the day, you don't really have to think hard about what else to do because anything you still have the energy to do is pretty minor and doesn't have to take up a lot of thought. Remember back at the start of this section, I talked about games cycling their decision space, where it goes up and down every few turns, which is a really nice way to space out moments of intensity and difficulty with moments of simplicity and relaxation. I used the example of the board game Catan. So in that game, your goal is to build things by spending resource cards. So on turns where you have a bunch of cards, you need to decide what you're going to build, where you're going to build it, figure out what choice will give you the best return on your investment, think about whether you need to block any other players or avoid getting blocked in yourself. In short, there's a lot of decisions to make. But then after you spend those resource cards, pretty much the only thing you can do on your next turn is gather more cards and start saving up again so you can kind of relax and just move the game along for a couple of rounds until you get enough resources to build again. And I think arguably that's even more engaging a design than non-stop intensity, which can be fun, but also very stressful. And so mana mechanics let you save your attention for key moments and vary the intensity 
by interspersing moments where you don't have to pay as close attention or make those complicated multi-part decisions. There's an important secondary function to mana mechanics too in creating or reinforcing requirements, required choices within a game that make the player regularly do whatever it is they have to do in order to recharge their limiting mana resource. Resource blocks, returning to your base periodically, taking a shot at the basket, or just waiting for a minute or two before you jump ahead into the next battle in an action RPG. This function can mesh really well into a curriculum design because mandatory or strongly encouraged activities are kind of a staple of how we do formal schooling. I'm not here to debate the merits of that reality today, it just is a reality. I've taken plenty of classes where I had to do something like submit at least 80% of the homework assignments to pass regardless of how I did on the tests or the other things, or things like attendance requirements, or at the level of curriculum, distribution requirements. These things all push students to perform certain basic universal actions on a regular basis. I think where the standard curriculum model could be improved would be instead of tallying this all up at the end of the marking period, and expecting students to do a lot of keeping track of their own progress in the meantime, you could treat these things more like mana mechanics, where they fill up an energy meter every time they hand in their homework, come to class, then once it's full, they can use it to buy more options or resources for the final project, which is basically similar to what I've tried to do in this course. You need enough XP every couple of weeks to unlock the next required milestone. So like I said, unlocks and mana mechanics are complementary. I've presented things in terms of unlocking and growing the decision space, but I could have also framed basically the same design as a mana meter that is limiting your decision space until you charge it up enough. So mana mechanics are great for simplifying decisions and establishing a rhythm in games, but what they do for high-level players who have achieved system mastery is create optimization problems, which is also worth a quick mention. Lots of role-playing games like World of Warcraft and others have prominent mana mechanics that regulate the pace of gameplay, but they're not very restrictive, and any player who just puts in the time can learn to use them well enough to play through all the core content of the game on their own. But then players who reach the highest level, who've done all the main content and still want more, the designers can use the mana mechanics that allow them to add really hard end game content that challenges players to make the most efficient use out of their mana that they possibly can. To find ways to convert mana into healing or attack spells as fast and as efficiently as possible in order to be good enough to be the super high level end game boss fights. Mana can also be optimized in really unethical ways, too, on the design end. There was a big kerfuffle a few years ago now over a mobile game called Harry Potter Hogwarts Mystery. So this was a game that was very much aimed at kids, and it ran on a mana system where you had to spend energy to do various actions that would move the story forward. Your meter would recharge like one point every few minutes. And the way it was designed, you could play steadily for the first hour or so, just going along, and then you would reach a moment in the story where your character is trapped in a strangling vine, and you don't have enough mana to pull yourself out. And then the game would give you two choices. You could either wait for 40 minutes or an hour of real-world time until your mana recharged enough, or you could 
pay 99 cents to recharge your meter instantly and get out of the vines and keep playing. And again, this was a game aimed at 12 year olds who were being told they either have to leave their character in mortal peril for an hour, that's what this picture on this slide is, or just go ahead, tap the purchase button right now. Mom's credit card number's already saved in this phone. Go ahead, just buy more mana, keep having fun. And the publisher of the game justifiably got a lot of pushback over that design decision. I would say that pound for pound, mana mechanics used in this way are the most pablumy of all game rewards, because that desire for efficiency and optimization to not leave things hanging or feel like you've wasted your resources is a very powerful human drive. And while we, of course, all want to use our powers for good, it is important to see how they are used by the forces of evil. Okay, so that was a bit of a tangent. Let me get back to game mechanics for teaching and learning. So let me just offer one more design example of how we can use this concept of decision space and regulating it with these mechanics in a classroom design context. So I would like you for a moment to consider the problem of the homework pass. This is a very common example of a light gamification in teaching. It's a way to give students a little bit of control over their class experience, and it's just a humane acknowledgement that life is complicated and you can't always expect perfection. I am very pro homework pass, but I'd still like to present an alternative that is more geared towards thinkings in terms of creating and expanding decision space, the homework booster or multiplier. So just to fill in the details, let's imagine you're teaching a class where each homework assignment is worth 10 points. And you want to give students some flexibility, so you use homework passes to let them occasionally miss an assignment and still get the 10 points, so it doesn't ding their grade. It's just treated like they did it. But instead of that, what if you create an item that doubles the points for a homework that they hand in, going from 10 to 20? So mathematically, this works out the same. It's still adding 10 extra points above what the student would otherwise get for their homework grade. But by turning this into an upgrade mechanic, you expand the possibilities of the decision space. Now, this is not just a way to avoid a penalty when you make a mistake. It can also be used to work ahead or build up extra credit points or treated like a mana meter of sorts that you can draw on if you ever do need to skip a future assignment. And bonus, it puts the emphasis on highlighting students' best work rather than overlooking their failures. If I'm a student with a booster to spend, I'm definitely going to double check my work, make sure it's my best stuff, so it's going to have maximum effect. You wouldn't want to throw a boost like this away on bringing half-baked assignment from five points up to 10 when you could go from 10 to 20 on a good assignment. Now, maybe that's too complicated, you wanna keep things simple, and there's a lot of good instructional reasons to do so, in which case, stick with the homework pass. But if you want to expand possibilities and give your students a wider decision space to work with, and more say in creating their own learning plan, this is the kind of mechanical tweaking that will help you do that and shift the feedback in ways that will support those decisions. And that's what crafting challenges in this level and throughout the course are all about. And with that, we are finally reaching the end of our discussion of pablum mechanics, rewards, and feedback in games, and how to apply some of these game design ideas to teaching and learning. We are, of course, going to come back to many of these concepts again and again, 
but the next few levels of the course will be focused on introducing higher level frameworks for things like motivation or identifying different types of players or learners. And these mechanics and their resulting dynamics will be the basic building blocks we can use to design and explore different approaches to those bigger questions. So thank you for sticking with me all the way through this epic three-part trudge up the mountain of doom that is pablum gamification. I hope something in all this will wind up being useful to you, or at the very least that you feel better prepared to call out rewards-based pablum games and gamifications, of which there are a depressingly huge number in the educational game space. But now that you know what to look for and how much more game mechanics could do for learning if used thoughtfully, hopefully you're prepared to be critical in that way. And it honestly shouldn't be that hard to use these design elements in the classroom, because as I hope I have demonstrated, we are all already doing these things. We are delivering feedback through points and achievements and levels, and the tools and the potential of games for learning are already in your hands. All you have to do is decide how you want to use them. So go do that in the upcoming levels, please. I am, of course, always available if you have questions, and otherwise, I will catch you later.